Today I want to offer a critique of a first species counterpoint that was submitted recently and also present another demonstration of writing a first species counterpoint. The cantus firmus we have here is the same melody as our first example of counterpoint, except now it's in a major rather than minor mode. Our original minor mode, cantus firmus, was this. I hope you remember that one. Now in a major mode, it sounds this way. All right, let me play it with our given counterpoint. So whether you're proofreading your own work or studying somebody else's counterpoint, here's a number of features that you're going to want to keep in mind. First of all, are all the harmonic intervals consonances? Remember, there are two types of harmonic consonances, perfect and imperfect. What are the harmonic consonances? Perfect unison, the perfect octave, and the perfect fifth. The imperfect harmonic consonances are the major minor thirds and major minor sixths. Listen carefully to this. This is really useful to know. All diatonic unisons, octaves, thirds, and sixths are harmonic consonances. Did you catch it? Let me say that one more time because it's really handy to know. You cannot write a diatonic unison, octave, third, or sixth that isn't a harmonic consonance. Did you notice that I left out one of the perfect consonances from this list? Right, the perfect fifth. All diatonic fifths are perfect except for which one? Well, in a major key, like the one we have here, it's between scale degrees 7 and 4. Every other diatonic fifth is guaranteed to be perfect. So in this example, since I don't have any diatonic fifths that are A to E flat, that diminished fifth, we're good. Every interval we have here is a harmonic consonance. All right, were there any rules about when to use perfect versus imperfect consonances? Well, of course. Social distancing and the perfect consonants. Uh, the counterpoint has got to end a perfect octave above the cantus firmus, but we can begin either with a perfect fifth or a perfect octave above it. Does this mean perfect consonances are forbidden in the middle of the counterpoint? Well, no, but it just means we have to take special care when including them in the middle. So let's circle all of the perfect consonances. The most important rule regarding approaching a perfect consonance is this. Always approach a perfect consonance in contrary motion. Well, we begin with the perfect octave. Great. But perfect fifths have infiltrated our counterpoint in measure three and in measure seven. So in both cases, we approach them in contrary motion. So well done. However, you are currently only authorized to use a perfect octave inside the counterpoint when it's the middle of a voice exchange. If you have a license for perfect consonants distribution that I'm not aware of, I apologize, but otherwise, Please restrict your perfect consonances to the beginning and end of your counterpoint. Okay, let's uh, talk about melodic contour a little bit. The apex of the cantus firmus is in measure 7. The counterpoint's apex is in measure 8. Now this isn't ideal to have both apexes in such close proximity. Uh, separating the melodic peaks from one another really helps us to hear the independence of each melody better. Uh, one of the most important features of good counterpoint is melodic retainability. In other words, how easy is the melody to remember? Looking at our cantus firmus, I can quickly memorize this melody due to its internal logic. Uh, the opening B flat skips to D, it walks down, leaps to E flat, walks down, skips to F, and walks back down. I both see and hear a stepwise relationship between the D, the E flat, and F peaks in the phrase. 
So another rule that we want to focus on, write simple, memorable melodies. Simple, memorable melodies. So what makes a melody memorable? Well, first I would say, is it singable? If you can't easily sing it looking at it, you probably aren't going to retain it very long. So what makes a melody singable? Well, all the rules we've discussed regarding writing a good cantus firmus exist for this very purpose. Uh, use mostly stepwise motion. All melodic leaps need to be prepared and resolved by step in the opposite direction. Uh, use only melodically consonant intervals, just to name a few. Now today's example sparingly uses stepwise motion. Of the ten pairs of adjacent pitches, I only count three stepwise moves. Now luckily one of them is at the very end where it's required, but 30% is far from being a mostly stepwise melody. Now, I don't see any skips of a third, but a lot of leaps of a fourth. There are four of them. There's also a leap of a fifth and a leap of a sixth. Now, the first leap of a fourth resolves itself by recovering a step in the opposite direction. And that's great. But measures four through seven are all leaps of a perfect fourth. There's no preparation, there's no resolution, just random melodic fourths. Is it singable? Well, of course it's singable, but not predictably so. If I remove the notation from the screen and sing it for you, Do, Sol, La, La, Re, Sol, Re, La, Sol, Ti, Do, Go ahead, sing it back to me. Do you remember it? I can't hear you. Well, it's not very memorable, is it? Well, remember that if you're going to use consecutive skips and leaps, they have to arpeggiate a consonant triad. This is a very disjunct melody because of it. All right, let's uh, move on. Let's practice writing a counterpoint over this new cantus firmus. This cantus firmus is nine notes long, it's in G minor, and has the range of a fifth. The apex is in measure two, so I'm going to make sure I aim for my counterpoint to reach its peak a little bit later in the melody. So the cantus firmus begins with a perfect fifth leap up, moves stepwise back down to tonic, and then followed by a small skip back up a third, which also steps down to tonic. Very simple, very memorable. As usual, I'm going to start at the end. The counterpoint is going to have to end on the tonic G an octave higher than the cantus firmus. Now, since we are in G minor, I need an accidental to create a leading tone, which is going to precede the final. Now, I'm approaching the final perfect consonants in contrary motion, and these two pitches are not optional. All right, let's go back to the beginning. I can either start on a G or a D. That's the octave or fifth above the cantus firmus. Now, I don't want to start on this D because the cantus firmus is getting ready to leap to that pitch. But I also don't want to start on the higher D. Uh, this would likely cause the apex to appear too early in the melody. Uh, and that's the location of the cantus firmus apex. So the octave it is. Now I'm always on the lookout for places to stick a voice exchange. I just can't get enough of them. So I'm noticing the skip of a third in the cantus firmus. This is measure six and seven. I can use that in a voice exchange. Using this voice exchange, now in measure seven and eight, I have parallel six. It gets me very safely to the leading tone in measure eight. So now the last four measures sound like this. Back at the beginning, after the cantus firmus leaps up the fifth, it moves stepwise down for a really long time. I could balance this leap with stepwise motion down in the counterpoint, going from G to F. So I have contrary motion, going from the octave to a third. I could then 
keep moving stepwise, creating parallel thirds. The problem I see with this though, is that I need to reach my apex by measure five or six, and I seem to be moving in the wrong direction to help set this up. So instead of parallel thirds in measures three and four, um, how about I use parallel sixths? That would be this, so. So the A and G in measures three and four create parallel six with the cantus firmus. That's not too bad. And in measures five and six, I could create parallel tens. So together, all that would sound like this. It's not too bad, but what I don't like about it is the repetition of this descending stepwise motive. We have one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, right? All of these, there's four of them, right? The melody repeats that motive four times. It really disrupts having a smooth melodic flow. I do, however, like the high C in measure five as the apex. So I could vary the pattern by changing measure two to create parallel six with measures three and four. Now the first four notes of the counterpoint are exactly the same as the last four notes of the cantus firmus. Now that's pretty slick, but uh, what I don't like about that is that out of the nine measures, four of them in the counterpoint are now the tonic pitch. It creates a little stagnancy in the melodic line. But I spy with my little eye the possibility of a voice exchange in measures three through five. Now since the cantus firmus is passing from C to A, the counterpoint can move from A up to C with an octave B flat in measure four as passing. The voice exchange removes the multiplicity of G's in the counterpoint, and it also provides additional contrasting motion, which is always useful. This is what this sounds like. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Even though I'm sure given time, we could find even more areas in need of improvement. So until next time, thanks and keep practicing.